Hi, I'm back. I know I did just one of these just yesterday, but I would like to tell you about something new that I found that I think is important because each day matters and time is really important when we're facing exponential growth like what this virus is doing. Uh, I ended last yesterday's talk by uh, mentioning this could go either way, like South Korea or like Italy. Before that, I also mentioned this virus is already widespread. That's been one of the things that I've repeatedly mentioned throughout these. Uh, and so don't have any doubts that the virus is already here. We're not worried about it coming from overseas. Whatever we do with international travel, probably not going to change the course of this disease very much. At the very least, in the Seattle area, it's definitely out of the box. And we've got to deal with it now. And so it's become everyone's problem. And uh, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is Italy. It's uh, a health care crisis there where the um, hospitals are completely overtaxed and overworked. The good news is South Korea. And I mentioned something about this at the end of yesterday, but something just came out. I went out on a limb uh, and I made a prediction that the numbers would continue to go down, even though they had spiked up for one day. In fact, technically almost doubled for one day. The, I said that the numbers would go back down because you should read the whole graph and the trend for more than a week has been the bell curve where the numbers are going down. And I found this in a couple of places online. Last night it was reported that the new day of case reports came in from South Korea and only 114 new cases were found which is really good because it is the lowest addition. Notice that this headline doesn't really put it that way. It sounds bad when you first look at it, but it's actually good. If you put it on this bar graph, which includes the day before yesterday's data that had us a little bit worried, we put it on that scale and you see that the bar for the most recent day is actually down to the lowest levels since mid-February. And so that means that South Korea is doing something right. Like I mentioned, they're doing a lot of testing. They're doing that right. And they're also taking a lot of measures to reduce their contacts. They've closed the schools. Thankfully, we've just done that in Seattle. And we need to do that. It's our best hope of actually keeping this thing at a level that the hospitals can barely handle it. So it's for all my friends in the healthcare. I mean, I teach doctors who go into this world. and. Uh, they're, they're going to be treating patients right now. And you need to um, be ready for this if you're pre-med. Uh, but you can deal with it if you have the community behind you as well doing its part. So the, th the other thing that I see from South Korea is we have um, death rates by age from South Korea now. We can compare those to the ones reported from China. And there is good news in two ways here. Good news number one is that the same shape of the curve when you organize um, the mortality of COVID-19 by age, you get the exact same shape of the curve for South Korea and for China. That means that we can probably say it's going to follow the same shape of the curve everywhere else with the factor that's different going to be what resulted in China's rates being twice the size of South Korea's. The basic answer is that the healthcare system in South Korea was not overwhelmed, where in China it was, despite a Herculean effort on the part of China to provide that health care, it was not enough. So how do we make a case where health care is not overwhelmed, where we have death rates in South Korea that are down around 1% or below 1% even? or in China versus in China where they are about 2% or 3%, depending on how you measure the cases. So I want to make the huge point. The real problem right now is um, the critical care crisis. That comes before it shows up in the death rates. And this is what's happening in Italy right now. Now the thing is, I don't have good public data for this. We can get tweets on Twitter, we can get stories from it. The stories sound like a war zone. And the important thing for us in Seattle when we're on the front end of this is to try to avoid this uh, war zone that the virus has imposed on the entire area uh, by now by doing whatever we can. And so remember that by the efforts at Evergreen, they have been able to deal with the virus so far 
but each, of the, each day that there are signs that the hospitals in Seattle are getting more and more overloaded because you have people keep coming in. When they come in, they have to stay for a week because they have to be on oxygen. They can't breathe. And that takes a long time for the virus to go away. So don't look at the low death rates as being a good sign because those take a long time to even manifest. What is a huge problem is the long hospitalization rates. And so what can you do about it? Um, not everyone, it doesn't work like it's in the movies. It doesn't work like Iron Man going and inventing a new element to help him uh, fight the bad guys. We do have some scientists and I hope against hope that something will work in the lab where we're going to invent something in the lab that might actually help us and like I said before, probably repurpose something. There's some hope for that because after all, this is uh, a virus that works in the ways that we know how viruses work. But we don't have that yet and we do not know if it's coming. So in this world where we can't do this and we don't know what to do, the thing to do is to minimize physical contact as much as possible. That's why we keep talking about washing your hands, not touching your face, um, not uh, being careful about how you touch doorknobs and basically being a germaphobe because we have a germ that is very, um, we should be very phobic of. So business as usual is not going to be an option. In a sense, Italy tried to do some soft interventions and it did not work. We need to reduce contacts by at least half as a group. And I think that this reducing contacts by half is a good goal for us each to have. If we can do this for ourselves, then we can uh, do it in aggregate as a group. And we can also need to do it for the people who can't reduce their contacts, the people such as the doctors treating this disease. I base this on an actual scientific study tailored for this region. This is for King and Snohomish counties. And it just came out March 10th at 4 p.m. So you can see the time stamp is important on this. And it comes actually from the lab, um, Trevor Bedford, I've mentioned him, his work before, he's been on the nextstrain.org and he's been tweeting about that. But this is a group of people from Institute for Disease Modeling, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation and the Fred Hutchinson that are making predictions about what will happen assuming the 1% mortality, which is again, what I think is a pretty good guess. Uh, two podcasts ago, there was uh, my reasoning for why I think a 1% mortality rate is probably what we're dealing with. And again, that's 1% mortality, assuming the healthcare system does not um, break down in a major way and increase those numbers, multiply them even by a factor of two or three. That's what we're trying to avoid. So how do you avoid that? If you have business as usual, by April 7, you have 25,000 infections and 400 deaths. Again, the deaths number is not the kind of thing that you, keeps people up at night worried, but the estimated infections would do it and this would have a cascading effect. This is just what would happen from coronavirus. What if these destined deaths go with a 4,000 hospital beds being taken up by this? We don't have 4,000 hospital beds that would adequately care for 4,000 patients. So in this case, the health care system would be certainly overwhelmed if there was business as usual. But the real question is, how much do we have to reduce contacts between people, physical contacts, to be able to make a dent in this? And I want to point out that just a 25% reduction estimates uh, that will drop the infections by a huge amount and drop the dust and deaths by a huge amount. And again, if we have uh, 160 times 10, if that's the amount of people in hospital beds, that's 1,600 people in hospital beds. In the counties, we only have 1,000 critical care beds. That's still probably overloading the system, but it's a lot closer to what we can conceive of as manageable with um, support from the community for this whole thing. So that's why I'm saying when I look at this chart, I want to get the 50% reduction that would get infections down to 5,000, deaths and deaths down to 100, and that would get estimated beds used in hospitals. And again, this is just an off-the-cuff, um, back-of-the-envelope type calculation for me. But I think that would get beds used down to 1,000. And that would probably be hard for the hospitals to handle, but I can see that number working a lot better than 4,000. Um, again, we have 5,000 beds total 
and there's a lot of people using those beds already, and we need to um, care for everyone. Here's the curve that shows how active infections are projected to be changed. Uh, business as usual is going to be the, um, the blue line. Notice that they actually have a typo in the legend. This shows you that we scientists are working on this as fast as we can, and we don't care about little things like typos about how usual is spelled in the legend up there. What we care about is the line, and the line is going up exponentially if business as usual is taken care of. Now, we've already taken some measures to reduce contacts, and the question is, do those measures reduce contacts by 25% or 50%? They almost certainly have not reduced it by 75%. It's hard to reduce contacts because you've got to touch something, right? Uh, in fact, on a normal working day, about only about one-third of your contacts come from work. So if you're working from home, great. Um, as you can see, I'm in the office, but I'm not touching anything or going near anyone, so hopefully this is like working from home for me. But even for me, I assume that this, um, the status at SPU where we have sort of shut down classes and we are keeping everyone away from each other, I think that that's probably reducing like 25% of my contacts at most. I want to try to figure out how to get another 25% of my contacts out of my day. Um, and that includes things like hand washing. If you wash your hands a lot, you've reduced the contact because you've reduced the chance of the virus getting into you. Um, so only about one third of your contacts come from work. If you're working from home, great. You're contributing to this. You brought us for your part from the blue line to the yellow line. But now what we really want to do is we, the yellow line still has active infections going up in the beginning of April. What we want to do is we want those active infections to be flat. And so what I would be ideal for me is to reduce it to the green line, have a 50% contact reduction, and that results in a flattening of the active infections. Realize that this goes down to having only, um, and I say only, but that goes down to 100 deaths, which is about um, a death rate similar to what we're seeing right now. If this death rate starts to go up, in some senses, it's already too late, but we need to um, look forward and say, oh, it looks like we need to avoid this exponential growth. It looks like we can do it if we can get 50% contact reduction. And so let's all think together about how to get that 50% contact reduction. Closing schools was a good first step, um, but also it's a little bit complicated because that doesn't necessarily completely reduce the contacts that were had in school. Those contacts sometimes show up somewhere else, but at least they're not as geographically widespread, and that's the main point. Think about contacts, think about how you can reduce your contacts, and let's try to get to 50%. We'll know when we see the death rate plateau, uh, and we will know when we hear from our doctor friends that they actually are humanly able to do what they need to do to fight this epidemic. The other thing I noticed about this, I, before I said that if you uh, had my best estimate about how long this would take, I estimated about 40 days, and there's historical reasons why this 40-day thing is a very typical thing for, for um, you know, quarantine situations. The 40-day um, mark for this is about at the end of this graph. And so this graph only predicts for the next 40 days what would happen under these different scenarios. So I think that we are bending the curve. I think that we still need to bend the curve more, and it comes down to really little things like reducing physical contacts in any way possible, and yes, washing your hands, because that erases the physical contacts that you've had, at least the ones for your hands. So um, 40 days is uh, the time that you have to impose these interventions. We'll have to restock and take uh, stock of where we are with that. I think if we can accomplish 50% contact reduction, we can flatten this out, and we can possibly look at each other and start planning about how to get back together again. But that's only if we can somehow get to that 50% contact reduction line. So with all that, the other story I have, again, I've mentioned before, as a Christian, I'm in the time of Lent, and I was actually reminded of a story that you don't usually think about in Lent, the story of Jonah. Jonah wasn't just a prophet who was swallowed by a big fish. In fact, that's only act one of his story. The reason why he's swallowed by a fish is because God told him to warn Nineveh that a judgment was coming in 40 days. And uh, Jonah didn't want to do it. Um, and, but then the fish convinced him, 
And Jonah went there and told Nineveh his story. Um, and Nineveh actually listened. And they took, they repented in sackcloth and ashes. Now, I'm not suggesting that we do that. That's sort of historically contingent, right? But um, in a sense, reducing your contacts and taking a break and a Sabbath from the many things that we have to do, uh, that is kind of like repenting in sandcloth and ashes in one sense, in the sense that the word repent means turning yourself around, 180 degrees, turning around what you're doing. And so I think that if we, we know that this has a physical basis, but there's a social implication to it. And really, we can't do very much about the physical basis right now unless you're a doctor or unless you're at a hospital. But we can do something about the social basis of the physical transmission of this virus. And there's even a spiritual aspect to it. Uh, we are being told to slow down and to do things electronically and to um, socially isolate. And that's the thing about me. Community is very important. But in this case, because of the physical nature of this exponential growth, we do need to socially isolate for a time. And so I think in a sense, the, um, a 40-day period of social isolation could be not just a Lenten fast, but sort of a, um, even a kind of repentance. If you want to uh, take that word away from the many different ways it can be taken. I want to take it in the sense of Nineveh being warned that exponential growth is coming, a plague is coming. What can you do? Well, you can turn and you can cut out the things from your life that are not necessary and um, basically don't give this honestly evil virus a chance to spread any more than it absolutely has to through the daily business of living and through the work of our healthcare providers. I feel like I've probably said things wrong with that. You know, um, please don't take me as saying something that I don't intend to say, and I know it's very hard to know what I intend to say, but mostly I'm speaking to my friends in the church here. If um, you have a warning from somebody saying that something bad is coming in a matter of weeks, what can you do? And you can do this simple thing to try to flatten the curve, and it looks like if we can do the simple thing effectively, and we, if we can do it enough, we can actually have a curve that is the green curve where the active infections actually flatten out. In fact, um, there are other factors that suggest that after they flatten out, they will go away. It is happening in South Korea, but it's not happening in Italy right now. So everyone, physically take care of your bodies, take care of um, uh, reduce, cut any transmission lines that this virus can gain. Spiritually, I want you to um, consider how you can uh, trust in God through this and, um, you know, pray for each other. That's, uh, I'm convinced that that's something that, that's something that I know is going on in South Korea as well. And so I want to say, um, as a scientist, I look at the body a lot, but all of us have a spirit and all of us can pray. And when you pray, go into your closet, close the door, your Heavenly Father knows what you need. So here's a scientist telling you to pray, looking at data. Um, it's a weird world, okay? But that's where we are right now, and so I want to keep this short, so I'll, I'll stop myself from saying that right now. And again, um, please uh, consider that um, I'm, re I'm reduced in the way I'm able to talk about this, but uh, this is beyond all of us. And so let's try to be kind to each other, and one of the ways we can be kind right now is reducing contacts. I'd like to, if you'd like to look at the actual paper, see the uh, assessment, remember that this paper does not assess the role of a healthcare failure. And I think a healthcare failure, healthcare system overload, is what brings the death rate for this up above 1% to the 3%, 4% realm. We will know, we're, we're being tested, and our healthcare system is being tested. And so be strong, support each other. Take care of the healthcare workers in your family. Try to find out if you can help take care of their kids if they are um, if they uh, need someone to help now that schools are out. And let's keep doing everything we can to um, to kick this thing and allow the winds of change to blow in. All right, thanks everyone.